Hi, welcome back. In this, the third session in my series on accounting, I want to look at balance sheets. Put simply, when you think about what a balance sheet should capture, there are dueling views even among accountants. One view of a balance sheet, it should, be a it should record what you've actually invested in assets, a record of capital invested in your land, your building, your current receivables, whatever assets you show on your balance sheet. The second is that it should record what the current value of those assets is. Earlier in one of the sessions, I talked about fair value accounting. The essence of fair value accounting is this push to make sure that assets that are shown in the balance sheet reflect the value that you'd get in the marketplace today. The third is the balance sheet should reflect what you would get if you sold those assets in the marketplace. So if you look at those dueling views, return, capital invested, current value or liquidation value, you can already see why balance sheets can pull in different directions. So let's break balance sheets down. Look at fixed assets. For the most part, these tend to be physical assets and they tend to have long lives. You got current assets, assets with lives less than a year. And you got financial assets, investments in securities or other companies and intangible assets. We'll come back and talk about those. Current liabilities tend to be things you owe in less than a year, short-term obligations, including short-term debt. Debt, especially debt with an obligation longer than a year. Other liabilities, things that you might owe that might not show up as part of debt. And equity, reflecting what the accountants think the equity in this business is worth. Let's start with fixed and current assets. The way I would start accounting, and I'm old, so this reflects the old way, is records fixed assets at what you paid when you bought those assets, net of what loss in value you think they've had since you bought them. That loss in value, of course, is captured through depreciation. That's the old way. The new way, of course, of fair value accounting is that you should record these assets and what those assets are worth today. Now, I don't think, as I said, accountants should be valuing assets, but with fair value accounting, that's what they try to do. And the effect on financial statements can be very different depending on how old you are as a company and what kind of assets you have. And here's why. Older assets will have a much bigger effect when you mark them up to current value. And fixed assets will have a much bigger effect than current assets. After all, inventory has not been sitting around for 15 or 20 years, but land building and equipment might have. So it's fixed and current assets. Old ways, record what you paid for them, net of depreciation. New ways, try to reflect what they're worth today. With financial assets, they could take the form of either holdings of securities in publicly traded companies or holdings in other companies. You know, 3%, 5%, 10% of another company. When you're holding publicly traded securities, I think the movement is almost complete, reflecting the value of those holdings at current market value. Because they're publicly traded, that should be a market price. Now, with holdings and other companies, how it's accounted for will depend on whether the stake is a minority stake, where you own 3, 5, 7, 10% of a company, or a majority stake. If it's a minority stake, you should show the portion of the income or loss you have in that company. It's called the equity approach but it showed below the operating income line. If it's a majority stake, you have to do consolidation, which means you've got to act like you own 100% and incorporate all of the revenues, the operating income of that company as part of your revenues in your operating income. It'll also depend if it's a minority stake, the way it's accounted for will depend on why you're holding the, the, that stake. You're saying, what do you mean why you're holding the stake? If you're holding it for trading, you're required to mark it up to market. In other words, you have to make your best estimate then of what that 5% of the other company is worth given your estimate of the value of the company today. That's if you hold it for trading. If you hold it for business purposes, your holding is for the long term, then you might be able to get away reflecting that holding in book value terms. Already you can see that when a company has financial assets, you might have to dig a little deeper to get a sense of how those assets are being recorded in the balance sheet. And then you have intangible assets. Now, accountants have you know, are taught the big game when it comes to intangible assets. They talk about how much intangible assets account for as a portion of the value, and they're absolutely right. And if you and I think about intangible assets, we think about things like brand name and technological advantages and networking benefits. But accountants, when they record intangible assets on balance sheets, reflect a very different reality. I call it small bore accounting. If you're looking for Coca-Cola's brand name value on its balance sheet, stop looking. Because even if you find, there'll be no reflection of what its true brand name value is. In fact, 
the most widely reported intangible asset is not an asset at all. It's goodwill. Goodwill is fiction. It is perhaps the most destructive and dangerous item created in accounting because it reflects almost nothing. And let me explain why. For goodwill to manifest itself on your balance sheet, you have to do an acquisition. Put simply, if you're the greatest company in the face of the earth and you've grown entirely with internal investments, there will be no goodwill. The minute you do an acquisition, goodwill shows up. You say, what does it measure? It measures the difference between what you paid for a company and what the accounting book value for the company was with a little dressing up. It's a reflection of a plug. And the reason goodwill has to show up in the balance sheet is very simply to make balance sheets balanced. So for all of the items on a balance sheet, the one that has the least behind it is goodwill, but it is the biggest chunk of intangible assets in accounting. We'll talk more about intangibles as we get into financial analysis but accounting, when it talks about intangibles, often is talking about an item that really doesn't matter. Now, one of the follow throughs on Goodwill is, remember I said, you have to record it at the time of the acquisition. It's the difference between what you paid and the book value. Now, the old way of taking Goodwill off the books was to just write it off in equal annual installments over a long period, 30, 40 years. It was an autopilot. Those rules have changed. Since the late 90s, both GAAP and IFRS require accountants to impair goodwill. What does that mean? Every year, accountants have to come in and look at the company acquired and ask the question, did you pay too much or didn't you? If you paid too much, the value of what you acquired has dropped since the acquisition, you have to impair goodwill. If it's gone up, you don't. So it's kind of a one-sided process. But that impairment of goodwill often means that you can get big charges against goodwill in some years and nothing in other years. Now, the reason accountants claim that they wanted to move to this new approach, they said, we need to give investors more information. That impairing goodwill is more informative than just writing off 140th every year. Is it? When you look at goodwill impairments and you look at the market reaction that you get to goodwill impairments, even if they're multi-billion dollar impairments, you know what the market reaction is? Nothing. And you know why? Because by the time accountants get around to impairing goodwill, everybody knows that goodwill has already been impaired. In other words, if you bought a company for $10 billion four years ago and the value dropped to $2 billion, it dropped two years ago. By the time accountants wake up and say, hey, the value dropped, everybody already knows. So I think it's created more noise. And this is just my cynical view than adding to information. But it is what it is. Now, when you look at current libraries, broadly speaking, current libraries can be broken into three groups. One is non-interest bearing current libraries, accounts payable, supplier credit. Basically, these are things you do in the process of business. Interest bearing short term libraries, including short term borrowings and the short term portion of long term debt and deferred items. Deferred items can include things like deferred revenues. Remember early in the income statement discussion, we talked about companies that sell items for multiple years but collect the revenues today. When you do that, the deferred revenues will show as part of the current libraries. If you owe salaries or fees to other people, it'll show up here. Deferred taxes, deferred salaries, deferred revenue. They're all part of current libraries. When computing non-cash working capital, an item we'll talk about, my suggestion is you remove the interest-bearing short-term debt from the rest of current libraries. It's a very different creature. But this is something we'll come back and talk more about in the context of computing cash flows. But current libraries should be. There should be less debate about them because most of them have been on your books just a few months. When it comes to debt due, debt due can take three forms. The first is corporate bonds. Companies, especially in the U.S., often raise money by issuing debt to public markets. You've got bank loans, short term as well as long term. And then you've got lease debt. Lease debt until 2019 did not, for the most part, show up on balance sheets unless it met some criteria that only a few companies met. Starting in 2019, all companies are required to report their lease commitments as debt. Corporate bonds, bank loans and lease debt. Now, the move towards the mark to market that you saw on the asset side is also creeping in to the balance sheet side. And you're seeing attempts to mark debt up to market as well or down to market. But for the most part, bank debt, if you look at it, or corporate bonds will reflect what you raised at the time of the issue, not what it's worth today. 
So when you look at the footnotes to the balance sheets, the footnotes can sometimes provide you information about the debt that a company has. And that information can be useful. So let me highlight some of the things you might be able to find if you dig through the footnotes. The first is you might get to see when debt comes due, something that's useful to know because you have to set aside cash to make that debt or issue new debt. You might be able to get see features on the debt. Is it floating rate debt or fixed rate debt, straight debt or convertible debt? And usually in most companies, you'll also see a table telling you when debt payments come due by year. Something that can be useful again in the context of estimating cash flows. Which brings us to the final item on a balance sheet, which is shareholders equity. Now, the old way in which shareholders' equity was, re was recorded was to reflect everything a company has done over its history. It was the ultimate historical number. The shareholders' equity for Coca-Cola in 1990 would have reflected everything that Coca-Cola had done over their history, starting with their IPO and every retained earning since, because in a sense, that's exactly what it was. The new way, though, as you start marking items up to market, will reflect not just your history, but also the marking up or marking down of items, which makes shareholders' equity a little noisier, a little more volatile. In my cynical view, you know, I know accountants are trying to mark the market because they want to make shareholders' equity a closer reflection of what the equity in the company is actually worth. I think they have zero chance of accomplishing that, no matter how hard they try. But that's not going to stop them from trying because I think that their end game is they want to make shareholders equity and balance sheets a competitor with the market cap as a measure of the equity in the firm. And final points about shareholders equity before we leave balance sheets or put balance sheets rest. The first is in many companies, when you look at shareholders equity, you'll see a breakdown which starts with par value. You think, what does that measure? I have no idea. I just ignore it. It's a throwback in time. There might have been a point in time a comp shares were actually issued at par value to the market. Those days are long done. I don't even know why companies bother reporting par value. Second, one thing you will notice with shareholders equity is as companies age, shareholders equity will start to get more substantial. Why? Because the history of the company will mean there's more retained earnings accumulating. The third is because only capitalized items show up as part of accounting balance sheets. When your accountants don't capitalize items that should be, and I want to be mysterious. Remember in the income statement discussion, we talked about how R&D at a pharmaceutical company, technology and content at Netflix are really capital expenses, but they're treated as operating expenses. When you don't capitalize those expenses, what you do is twofold. One is you don't count those items as assets and you also depress the value of your equity. I think that what you see as shareholders equity at technology firms and pharmaceuticals doesn't reflect even from an accounting perspective what the equity in these companies is worth. In the last two or three decades in the US, companies have also increasingly turned to buying back stock. You're saying, so what? When companies buy back stock, it can massively affect your shareholders' equity. And here's why. You have to reduce your shareholders' equity by however much money you spend buying back shares. And because the market value of these companies is often four, five, ten times the book value, a small buyback can deplete your shareholders' equity. In fact, that depletion of shareholders' equity can push the shareholders' equity not just towards zero, but beyond. One in eight U.S. companies has negative shareholders' equity. You're saying, what does that mean? Don't read too much into it. It's either a reflection that this company has been losing money for a long time. A lot of young companies have negative shareholders equity or a reflection of the fact that the company's done a lot of buybacks. So the bottom line is accounting balance sheets, in my view, try to do too much. If they're focused on reporting just what you invest in assets, I think they'd be more useful. But that's just my point of view. I hope you found the session useful and I will try to apply these concepts on real companies in a follow-up session. Thank you very much.